I think at the heart of what makes great content is that it drives awareness and sales. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Byron, host of the Sales and Podcast, and welcome to today's show. Today's show, we have Chris Smith, who's author of The Conversion Code. And on today's show, I'm asking him what we need to do as B2B sales professionals to win at prospecting in the internet age. You can find out more about Chris over at creator.com. We link to that and everything else in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.red. And with that all said, let's jump into today's show. Hey, Chris, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. What's up, man? Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you on, sir. I can see that you're smiling. I'm excited. And um, I feel like there's a lot to go out in this episode. And I don't want to, I said this before we click record, but just for the audience as well, we're very consciously going to steer away from the conversation of should salespeople create content? Should salespeople do their own lead generation? I think uh, if you listen to the show regularly, you know my thoughts on it in that there should be an element of this. There should be an element of control. Um, but where I want to start, Chris, is the leap that seemingly um, <laughs> for people who aren't pr- like practitioners in this, there's a leap seemingly between you create a blog post, you get attention, um, you're doing everything right from the marketing perspective, and then getting a lead. And this is what I want to start our conversation with of uh, hopefully you can explain uh, more eloquently than I ever can. How do we go from a blog post, which tell me if I'm right here, is primarily to get attention um, and, 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 and you know, eyeballs on your offering or you know, what, you, what you want to do next. And how do you go from that to having a lead, which is what clearly your salespeople really want to get hold of? Sure, that's a big question, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to tackle it. I think at the heart of what makes great content is that it drives awareness and sales not awareness or sales. And I think that's where people get caught up. Like, I think a lot more business owners would be willing to blog if they knew it would directly lead to business. So step one is, you know, when you're creating content, just, you know, ask yourself, is is this going to bring awareness? Meaning is is somebody going to want to read this? As an example, we did an article recently, seven Facebook pages worth stalking. And that article, you know, got 10, 12,000 views. But inside of each of those seven, three or four of the seven were client pages that we actually manage at Curator. And so the content was great. It it drove a bunch of awareness, but through linking and through some calls to action inside the post, we also got clicks and we got leads, which, which is what you asked about. So one way is to make the content itself focus on awareness and sales. We actually challenge ourselves to a third tier, which is retention. So can, can this content help me bring awareness through people who don't know me? Can it help me capture a lead once they're in it? And then can it even be used to keep my existing customers happy? You know, can it be almost like a churn burner, if you will? And for us, when, when something crosses all three of those, because our current clients loved reading that article, about the Facebook pages. The people that didn't know us loved reading it, but then the people kind of in the middle that kind of already knew us and they read it, you know, they fell for kind of some of the links and some of the calls to action. So that's one way is just, is this about, because like nobody really wants to read a big article about sales and then nobody really wants to write a big article about awareness. <laughs> so this should be advice people want to follow. But the second thing is you have to purposefully generate leads, not passively. That's a big part of this because if you have a blog and let's say you have, even let's just call it 10 pieces of content. Let's not pretend you're a prolific blogger. What what you've got to do is look at those 10 and and look at your data and say of these 10, which two were by far the most popular? Because typically that's what happens, kind of an 80-20 rule. 20% of your articles will get you 80% of your traction and leads. So what you can do is let's say you publish something and you got a bunch of people that read it and it was popular, but you didn't get any leads. Well, what I would recommend then is turning that article into something you now in the future have to register to access. So when you initially publish a post, you may put it in a Facebook ad and send it to your email list and let everybody read it. What we do is we do that too. But then after we see which of those things do the best, we grab them, we put them behind a landing page. And then we do more ads that say, would you like to access seven Facebook pages worth stalking? Subscribe to our list to get that article right away. 
So it's sort of multi-purpose, right? It, it's awareness and sales out of the gates. It's a little bit evergreen. That way we can use it long term to do lead gen with. But the difference is that when we send an email or, or do an ad and we don't make people register, we don't assume we would get a lead. And I think the biggest thing is most companies that are listening, they have a website, they might have a blog, but they probably don't have landing pages, which are sort of just a simple tool that grow your list on purpose. And so if you're just going to drive a bunch of traffic to your blog, let them read all your stuff, hopefully they hit contact or hopefully they subscribe, that, that passive approach just doesn't work. You have to do this on purpose. So there's a lot to go there, and I want to take a step back at this, and I want to um, dumb it down as much as we can without offending anybody, because clearly we both have uh, me running the podcast and all the marketing that we do, and mm -hmm. you, know, you being the expert in the space. Perhaps mm -hmm. we have a burden of um, a burden of knowledge here that we can perhaps talk on a higher level than what I know some of the listeners who are you know B two B sales professionals that want to do all this stuff. They see the value in it. Because uh, of course you you become an asset to your company if you're producing leads, uh, you almost become unsackable at that point, and you you perhaps become less of a salesperson and more just an integral uh, an integral cog in the in the machine. And so the first thing I want to touch on is you mentioned ten posts here. So this is clearly a common misconception when people are first starting out. So I'm going to ask you a horribly leaded and loaded question here, Chris. A salesperson who is perhaps so my background is medical device sales. Mm -hmm. I, I could easily comfortably produce content for the surgeons that I used to spend a lot of time with because I know exactly what their needs are. So that to me seems like the best place to start of all of this uh, content wise. Should I be aiming to do a new blog post every single day for the next three or four years that's 500, 1,000 words long that, uh, you know, I'm, and then you focus on SEO, which is search engine optimization, getting it up in the ranks in Google and all these kinds of technical things. Or should I focus on two, three, four like, epic resources sure. that, you know, you're going to take way more time to produce them. But then, yes. uh, as you said, as you kind of alluded to of reusing content, it can be mm -hmm. repurposed easier if it's a bigger guide on that scale. Yeah. And what you're asking is, should I put out great content regularly or decent content daily? Uh -huh. And I think decent is the devil. <laughs> I, 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 I think that it's very dangerous to do something every day because somebody said that if you do that, you'll get more SEO juice or something for, for me. And at my company, the way that we teach marketing is very simple. We teach a framework that I think all of your listeners, no matter what their skill level will appreciate, which is called cab C A B. And then there's an S there's a bonus S. So it's C A B S and it's create great content, advertise it on Facebook, blast it to your email list and then sell to the people that open it. Okay. Or the leads it creates. And when you think of content in a framework like that, the answer becomes clear because the question becomes, are you willing to pay to advertise what you published? And are you willing to email it to your entire list? And so we just think that's kind of a good litmus test that people can ask themselves. Like if you're not willing to pay to promote the article, and if you're not willing to email the article to your whole list, you probably should have never written it. Should we be focusing on paid advertising for specific posts, or is that something that comes later on? Um, and I've got my own thoughts on this, which I can share in a second, but you know, it is paid the way that we should be uh, moving towards we, you know, especially when we first started out, perhaps producing content. No, because if you don't have leads and appointments, you're not going to be wrong, around long enough for all that blogging to matter. So the way I teach it is that if you don't have leads coming in who are semi-interested in what you sell and you don't have calls to make to them, if you don't have that funnel in place, if you don't have the lead funnel in place, then I, I really think that you'd be pretty crazy to be spending money on things like likes or page views on a blog. So if you're first starting out, in my opinion, you don't even need a website. You need a landing page that, that provides a very clear, uh, direct response offer. If you give us your info, we will give you this. And once you've got those landing pages and those offers, those lead magnets, uh, you know, out there, and, and those are, getting traffic, 
you know, it's a lot easier to justify paying for a lead than paying for a like. So for me, the, the mastery of this process, you're absolutely right. You know, paying to promote content in the beginning is probably a waste of money. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're going to say, but it really is a waste of money to just promote a blog post or to run a campaign to get likes for your page or to get Twitter followers. So if you're starting out or really as you continue to progress, you know, the majority of your marketing budget should definitely be spent on building your business, not just building your brand. I think you've nailed this. And I think this is one of the things that every salesperson listening to this will get. And marketers don't always get. And marketers is a bigger conversation when you're talking about branding, especially on the larger scale. But I love what you just said of if you just have a landing page rather than a homepage with your name on and some crappy blog posts that no one reads. If you've got a landing page with a resource that you put time and effort into and it's useful, for example, for me with my surgeons, I don't know, it could be a... Uh, a non-sensitive uh, internally kind of a document that you put together with all the product specifications of all the medical devices that they use. So it, sure. you know, it's something that they would want to download. And obviously then you're yep. securing the email address and then you can continually email them after that point and be in front of them. Which leads me to my next question. Is email what we should be heading towards? Because this is a lesson that I've learned recently, a pretty harsh lesson. Should, because the, 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 the exciting stuff is, thousands of likes on Facebook or thousands of followers on Twitter. Is email still the king, especially in the B2B world? I, 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 th I would say yes and no. You know, email is certainly still the cheapest digital channel to convert leads. Because what's funny to me is when people start spending money on ads and they start spending money on lead generation, when I talk about CAB, right? It, for whatever reason, people kind of get excited about creating the content mm -hmm. and they get excited about running the ads and getting the leads. But for whatever reason, they don't get as excited about the blast, you know, the, the, the email follow up. And I'll tell you why, because when you send an email, let's say you have a thousand person, people on your list and let's say you get a 30 percent open rate. Let's say you get a five percent click through rate. Right. So you're talking about 300 people opened your email and 50 people that clicked on your email. Like as a salesperson, what am I supposed to do with that? Am I supposed to take that down to Wells Fargo and deposit it? Like open rates and the number of people that open and the click through rate and the click rate percentage, that's all a distraction from the real work of picking up the phone and calling people. And so what we do is the, the reason we get so excited about the email piece of this is because we look at email marketing as a way to identify the right leads to call. So we think of email marketing as a salesperson, it's actually a time saver. Because if I send an email to a thousand people, and let's say the subject line is um, still considering curator with a question mark. Well, uh, there's a thousand people, my guys can't call all of them. But if I get that 30% open rate, I can actually take 150 people per rep and give them a list of people that in the last 24 hours opened an email that said, are you still interested? So we're not going to be passive. We're not going to wait for the person to reply to the email. Say, yes, I am still interested, Chris. Here's my credit card. We're just leveraging the fact that they opened it to trigger a call for sales. And then if you have a, a list or if you're a business, let's say you have 5,000 leads, right? And, and now you have 1,500 that opened it and you may have 500 that clicked it. Well, well, what you can do is the bigger and the better your list is, you can actually have your reps stop calling the opens of the emails. You could actually have them just call the people that opened and clicked. Because if you're opening and clicking and the link in the email goes back to our website, now I'm calling a lead that got an email, opened it, clicked it, and went to my website all in the last day. And as a salesperson, that's a much easier call. Of course it is, for sure. It's a no-brainer. And I think even the and, numbers and just, have... so I, just so I make this point, drive it all the way home, it's called behavior-based follow-up. Most salespeople, when they get a lead, they put it in a database and they drip on it or they send it emails or they put it on some kind of, uh, I'll call once per quarter. And, and that's basically time-based follow-up. The lead came in today, so one week from today, we email them X. What we're doing is we're only following up based on their behavior. 
So when you stop calling leads because they're a month old and you start calling leads because they were on your site an hour ago, it's a whole different world as a sales guy. Well, there's a lot more we, we won't go into because it's a conversation itself behind the psychology of calling someone when they've just responded versus when you call someone on a, on a later date. And, and clearly the conversion rates go up hugely when someone is thinking about you and you've, they've got you on the mind, that your brain can just process it rather than having to come back at a later date and, and try and suss out where they were in the conversation. Um, but the process of qualifying through behaviors, which is how you just described then of, for me doing this in the world of medical devices, it would be, hey, would you like to try this brand new product or service or you know something along those lines, something that's timely. And again, the only people that are going to open those emails out of your potential customers that you've got on this email list are the ones that are genuinely interested. Because of course, why would you open the email otherwise? But I want to just emphasize something you mentioned here. So you, you've used the, the numbers of 1,000 or 5,000 people. Depending on your industry, for example, with me, I had a, a region that I covered with two or three hundred surgeons in the, you know, in the, in urology, perhaps in the country, I'm probably looking at getting in front of 50 of them. They're all on Facebook. It's, again, it's another more in-depth conversation that we're not going to have now, but with Facebook's targeting, you could very easily, at uh, not that much expense, get every email address for everyone that you want to target, offer them a bit of value, get them on this email list, send them these timely emails. And without too much effort, you've got a resource there that most companies don't have and you because you've got the opposite of scale on your hand you've got the ability to get super niched and targeted and there's just incredible value from that perspective as well right yeah for sure i mean at the end of the day like the way facebook charges for advertising is it's based on how many people you want to reach so if you're trying to reach 200 and i'm reaching 2000 it's going to actually cost you the same to reach your guys 10 times as it is to reach my guys one time. So don't be afraid to have a smaller audience. And, you know, people listening to the call now, a lot of them already have a database and they've already been generating leads. And, and what a lot of people don't realize you can do is you can go to any database and you can export your entire database. And then you can go to Facebook and do what they call a custom audience. And you can upload your current database to Facebook, and then that will become a group of people you can target. And so another big misconception in sales is that, you know, okay, we got the lead in our database, so we don't need to market to them anymore. We don't need to show them more <laughs> ads. And, and that's just not the case. The fact that they're in your database means you should show them more and different and better ads. It doesn't mean that your job here is done. So through things like retargeting, we use a company called AdRoll you know, where our banner ads follow you all over the web. Uh, we use the Facebook pixel so that we can retarget in the newsfeed. Uh, and it, it's very simple. Somebody clicks on an article and reads it. And then because they visited the next time they're in Facebook, it would have a different ad that would say, Hey, you checked out our blog recently. You might want to subscribe. Even and narrowing it down even further than that though, you could even have your face and image and it would probably, you'd be, it'd be difficult to do it. That it wasn't super cheesy, but if you could have, uh, again, going back to the surgeon uh, example, if there's, if there's an image of you going like waving around an endoscope that you're selling, I don't know, this would be horrible and cheesy. There's a better way to implement it, I'm sure. But that recognition of your face and your brand, and even if sure. it, a lot of it's subconscious, that has huge value in itself. And, you know, I used to make, say, you know, anywhere from uh, 500 quid to five, six grand per sale that we used to have with the, the camera stacks and even more when it got to a bigger um, you know, the bigger full theater deals when we used to fit them out. So it'd be comfortably worth spending 10, 20, 30, 40 quid or, or dollars, however, wherever you are to put these kind of things in place. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to run away too far with this because again, we're getting perhaps more complicated than what we need to. And I want to come back to the idea of the landing page, because clearly that's the, the place to start with all of this. How do we work out what our audience or what um, our potential customers want? How do we know what we should be building to entice them to sharing the, because it's a big ask in 2016 for someone to share their email. I'm sure it wasn't, uh, I'm sure it was easier in the past and we're all sure. covered in spam and we're, we're a lot more weary about it. How do we know what is really gonna impact our potential customers and, and, and entice them to share that email address with us? I think that most people overthink that question because like we work with a lot of real estate agents 
And if you think about the real estate industry and, and you have buyer leads and you have seller leads and what do buyers want? They want listings. And what do sellers want? They want to know what their homes were. So like, that's it. Like listings are the lead magnet on the buy side and home value reports are the lead magnet on the sell side. And what I've learned is that once you get too far outside of those sort of core things, it has a marginal return compared to those core things. So like a curator, you know, for us, like we just felt like if somebody's on our site and they're checking us out and, and, and we want to get their information because they're serious, you know, we have leveraged uh, the ability to download a full demo video of our system. Like we don't overthink it too much, right? Like there's times to get cute and there's times to not get cute. And so I think the best way to establish, like for me, and with what I sell, what should the lead magnet be? What should the deliverable be? It really would just be what have the deliverables always been? A another example would be mortgage and, and uh, people that are looking for a, a home loan. Like, wh what, do you, what do you think that they want? They wanna know what the interest rates are and they wanna know how much their payment will go down, right? So if I'm doing lead gen there, you know, my fastball down the middle is, would you like to know what the rates are? Would you like to see how that will lower your payment? Click here, give us your email, and we'll break that down for you. So I think most people try to get too cutesy. Like we had a couple uh, clients where they tried to get really content marketing, right? And they did 40 top tips for selling your home this spring. And they did eight ways to make your home worth more before you sell it. And it isn't that those things didn't work. It's just that they, they don't work at, a, at nearly the level that the regular stuff works. So the way I describe it in my book is, you know, what are the things people have always been willing to register to get? Or what are the things that another great way to look at this is, I'm guessing when you do a sales call, at the end of it, you probably have some nice collateral that you send that you maybe don't make available online, mm -hmm. but you basically send it after you've spoken to them. Well, maybe that becomes the thing that they can get to before they speak to you. So I, I think people overthink that question. It's sort of what have helped generate leads. Like, I, I don't know if you have a lot of attorneys near you, right? But like one of the best ways to generate leads as an attorney is to basically say, hey, if, if you get in an accident, we can help. And a, a big company where I'm from is 411 Pain. And their whole thing is <laughs> after 911, call 411, right? And, and so they're not trying to get cute. They're just still chasing ambulances. Well, I think this is, I, I like the way you're phrasing this because I've totally overcomplicated our marketing um, strategy from the, 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 the basis of collecting emails and, and messaging them over time. Um, and partly that is my own fault because I'm doing it for awareness to drive people back to the podcast, to download my podcast. And we can have a conversation about that another time. But we've overcomplicated it and we found that a short guide on the uh, the top three or four podcast episodes that outperformed anything that else that we've ever done as a as a opt-in bait for people to share the email with us versus kind of guides on influence and guides and all these other things which are really good guides and people enjoyed them they got a lot of value out of that but the conversion rate of someone landing on the website who wants to know more about the podcast and clearly the the next step for them is go well if there's three or four episodes that have been hand-picked I'll just get them. Uh, that was well higher than anything else. And getting real practical with this again, Chris, what what's the next step for building a landing page? Like, I, I, you know, I yeah. do it. I no, do it I, myself I, I, with uh, yeah, WordPress and plugins and that kind of thing. Are there any are there any software programs or anything that for people who aren't techie who don't have that skill set to um to you know, plug and play essentially? Yeah, there's three that I recommend, and I, I'll, I'll kind of give them in order of easiest to use. So if you're a tech novice, you would want to maybe look at something like Instapages. Uh, Instapages is kind of click, click, and you're done. Uh, the, the more medium one is called Lead Pages, uh, leadpages.net. And then the one that has sort of every feature you could ever dream <laughs> about is called Unbounce, uh, unbounce.com. And what I love about all three of these companies is they actually have industry centric templates. So if you are a, a realtor or a doctor or uh, you're in medical device sales, like believe it or not, if you just search your industry, 
they'll already have a bunch of templates. And, and the reason you want to start with a template is so you can just edit what's already there and what already looks good quickly and, and use it. Uh, one of my favorite features actually lead pages. They have a really cool feature where you can sort by conversion rate. So you could pull up every template from your vertical and then sort those to the top by which of those pages have converted the highest for all the people that have already tried them. So I find that little kind of uh, landmine of, of insight <laughs> to be very useful uh, for sure. Because if I can find a landing page that's been used by hundreds of people already, and let's say the conversion rate was 32% or something really good, you know, even if I screw it up and I, and I, I reduce the conversion rate by, you know, 75% lower, I still got a good rate. So, uh, and what happens is with salespeople, especially, you know, they sort of use their gut and they sort of try to get in and design something that, that they think looks good. And you just want to leave that to the pros. So, you know, when you go to lead pages, unbounce or Insta pages, you're going to want to find a template, basically edit the template you find and don't use your gut. You use the data. I mean, millions of people have already used these pages and they've already tracked how well they did. And, and so why would you reinvent the wheel? We call it riding on the back of giants. <laughs> you know, they've already done it. We'll just see what they can see, you know, before we try it. Because a lot of this is counterintuitive as well. Uh, we put in the title, oh shit, on our homepage, oh shit, not another pop-up. That converts at about 6% now without that text, which I was a bit hesitant to put in because obviously it's a bit in your face and obviously there's a swear word there. And, exactly. And corporate, you know, filters might pick up on it if people are browsing at work and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it, it still outperforms any other like phrase or text that we can use in that thing. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot to go at with all of this. And so I like your approach here of just keeping it simple and getting the job done as opposed to, because you can procrastinate on a lot of this, can't you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you're like, we have a, a pop-up or we have a, a, a page we use to, to grow our email list. And we've thought of 18 different million ways to, to say that. And we ended up just saying, you know, join 20,000 people who get our awesome emails. You know, I mean, you could uh, write that 8 million different ways <laughs> and try to get super clever. But I agree with you. We had, we've done hundreds of episodes of our podcast that we do called The Water Cooler. And, you know, when you get like you're, I think, in your 200 mm -hmm. plus episode as well. And what happens is a lot of the best stuff is at the beginning. You know, a lot of your best interviews may have been episodes, you know, six through 20. So we actually went back and found seven old episodes and the people that were on the episodes like combined sold about like five billion dollars worth <laughs> of real estate. So, you know, we basically turned that into, hey, check out how seven top realtors sold five billion dollars in real estate. And all we did was we just created a YouTube list of those shows and then we put that behind a landing page and and like you said it did great so i think sometimes people really do overthink like what's worth giving your info for well think about it if you have an article that got ten thousand people that read it well then probably a thousand would have given their info to read it not to say 90 percent wouldn't have bounced or closed and that is what happens on landing pages but you just have to ask yourself does it help my business more to get 10,000 page views or to get 1,000 leads. Definitely. That's uh, that's a, a, an exti um, extinction. That is a, uh, a what's it called? I can't think of the word. It, it, it misses me. But that is a separation between what a lot of people start off doing, which is what I did with the Sales and Podcast and all the marketing that we did. We were getting, well, we we're getting between 10 and 20,000 page views a day on the blog, but it didn't really mean anything. And as soon as I cut out all the crap and all the, clickbaity five ways to persuade yeah. xyz articles and we doubled down on the content that people actually wanted and cared about which is the show itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um our email opt-ins which is a, a metric that we uh we you know used to measure our growth uh, the number of downloads of the show per day jumped up like it, it it went crazy over literally the course of two or three weeks when we made that shift and so um there's probably an element of experimentation with all this to narrow down what's going to work for you but I think it's, uh, it's clearly a valuable tool. And yeah, clearly... another thing, by the way, just quickly, that we do in sales, we do something called a pre-call stalk. 
where we really check out the lead online. We use an app called Charlie that finds all their social profiles and tells us what they've been up to. And it gives us the ability to kind of, uh, you know, face the lead before we face the lead. And so as an example, don't get mad at me. I was doing a pre-call stalk on you mm -hmm. uh, because we had this call, trying to learn more about you, learn more about the podcast. And I actually noticed during that pre-call stalk that your About tab has a broken link in it on your site right now. And also your Twitter button in your footer, uh, it doesn't go to your Twitter. And I'm sure you'll fix that now that I brought it to your attention. But imagine being a sales guy who wanted to sell you equipment for your podcast or who wanted to sell you on maybe like bringing them on your show. And imagine if the first thing they said is, hey man, I wanted to ask you about your podcast, but you know, I was on your website and I noticed that one of the tabs in your header was actually not working. You know, you might want to fix that. Like you don't realize how people appreciate that right then. Like, oh my God, thank you so much. And then it just kind of throws them back. Like, all right, what do you got? What are you selling? Because <laughs> you led with help and you'd be amazed at like, especially you mentioned medical device people. Do you think if we went and spent some time on those doctors' websites or on those doctors' Facebook pages, there might be some suggestions, might be some errors. They might not even have their phone number in their Facebook page, stuff like that. So I, I think that's another kind of value add salespeople can bring no matter what they sell is stalk the lead online a little bit and, and maybe leverage in your script a couple things that you found that if you, you know, if I was your brother, I would want you to fix that because I care about you. And that's a weird thing for a salesperson to start with is, hey, I think you might want to check this stuff out. I know I would personally want to fix it right away. You may want to fix it too. And by the way, I got some stuff I want to sell you. It, it, you know, it disarms people. So the pre-call stalk, I think with the amount of stuff people share on social, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram, they're on LinkedIn. You know, you can almost always find some pretty helpful information if you just spend five minutes stalking people before you call them. For sure. <laughs> that about page link has been broken for about two months. I've just not got around to fixing it yet. <laughs> I will do after we finish Public up recording Public shaming here. works. <laughs> it does. It happens all the time on the show. I, I got absolutely roasted about six months ago for the state of my LinkedIn profile when a LinkedIn expert came on. And that forced me to fix that. So I will fix the about uh, cool. link on the, the top well, of the page. Well, you know what it was, man, is that for you personally, that's a page that matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Because you've got a great podcast and you've got great content. And what happens is there's this thing Google calls the zero moment of truth, where we go from discovery to sort of like, hey, I'm kind of sold now. What does this guy actually sell? And so for your site, it's actually the about page, right? Because you've got all this great content and all this helpful info and all these interviews, but it's actually very difficult to learn about you. And and I think a lot of people want to once they go into your content archive. So anyway, quick tip. I, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I've got one question I want to ask you, and you will be able to give us a unique insight on this in that you're not, you know, quote, most people come to the show are quote unquote sales experts. They've written books on prospecting very specifically or they've written books on you know, influence and this kind of thing. Um, so you're going to be able to give us a unique insight on this. What do you do when you go, you listen to the show, you're one of the 10, 20,000 people that are going to download it and you go, holy heck, I'm going to create a landing page right now. I'm going to pull, pull over, I'm going to do it on my phone and on bounce.com or wherever it is uh, or, and, and leave pages. And then they go and tell the sales manager and the sales manager goes, oh, I, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that you are creating content. I don't like the fact that you are owning leads, which you no, know, my company owns or the company they represent owns. What would you say to that sales manager? And then I'll share what I would say to them as well. Sure. Well, the, the beauty of your sales manager is that they get paid based on you getting paid. And so what's good for me is good for them. That's the whole point of commission and sales and the way they structure the payouts over there. But I've been in this situation. I started a very, very popular blog without permission. Uh, and by the time my company learned about it, we had over 10,000 fans on Facebook. It was like a really popular thing. And, uh, you know, I had to deal with this harsh reality that if you do create content or if you do generate leads while you're employed, you know, your company owns that. I mean, that's the way the rules work. Those are the laws of the land. And so I don't think anybody should get too upset if while they're working for Google, 
they build a search engine on the side. <laughs> When they find out that Google owns that, should they really be surprised? Probably not. Now, I think that we're, we're, what you have to do is you have to loop in the sales manager when it's appropriate. And I, I, I'm sometimes a fan of asking forgiveness and not permission. And had I not taken that leap of faith and started that blog, because once my company found out about it, you have to add the caveat that I was the number one salesperson at the company. So they're going to be a lot more lenient with me than with someone else. So part of it is like, if you're a middle producer or a bottom producer in the sales channel, I'm really not going to be that interested in anything you have to say. So part of it is just understanding your leverage. But when you're the top guy month in and month out, and you feel like something needs to change at the company, whether it's lead gen or lead conversion or the technologies that you're using, you should speak up. You should say, I think there's a better way to do this because they'll listen and they don't want to lose you. It's so hard to, to, to replace a really a top rep. So I think that my advice would be don't loop your boss in when you get a lead. Loop your boss in when you get a deal. Sure. And when you get a deal from the stuff that you're doing, they're going to be a lot more excited and a lot more willing to sort of hear you out and kind of move some of the HR stuff out of the way for you because you're generating deals, not distractions, which is what they see the other stuff as. And then if it doesn't work for them, I would just, and, and your system's working for you, there's plenty of other companies that within your industry that would, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat, jump mm. at that opportunity. Because I had this- sure, sure, I mean, a lot of companies, they want you to generate your own leads. They require it. Like on the first day, they say, give us a list of all your family and friends. That's your first list of leads. So most salespeople, from what I've found, you know, the company wants them to proactively prospect. But yeah, like if you send an email or if you run an ad or if you do a landing page, you know, as an owner of a company myself, you know, you do want there to be some standards and some quality and, and some consistency with the messaging. So well, as someone who owns a yeah. company, does that matter if your rep is performing as well as what you did? Can you let the aesthetics of things go aside as long as the customers are happy and they're being served? I personally can't because we're a real company that's growing fast. And the reason I can't let them do it is number one, because they don't need to. You know what I'm saying? We're in a position where we don't need our salespeople to generate any leads because we're very, very good at this. And so if you truly feed the fat, if you're truly filling the pipeline for your team with quality leads month in and month out, guess what? This conversation never happens. So for me, when I worked at Quicken Loans, a billion dollar company, when I worked for Lou Pearlman, a billionaire, when I worked at Move Incorporated and Realtor.com, a billion dollar company, none of those companies relied on me as the rep to generate the leads. And because I didn't have to generate the leads, I was able to get better and better and better at selling every day. But if you are at a company where you're sitting around and, and your job is to kind of cold prospect, you know, if when you cold prospect, the company also has a problem with that, you probably need a new job. And is that the differentiation here, Chris? Is that the, what we should be focusing on? Is that the uh, caveat to everything that was said in the past like 35, 40 minutes or so, that if you've got leads coming in, you should be focusing on closing them and maximizing your commissions rather than trying to create more leads and owning something that no one cares about because the problem's solved. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish we could have talked more about the third section of my book, and I know the reason we didn't is because you bring on a lot of smart salespeople, and I actually am pretty good at sales and pretty good at marketing, so I wanted to talk more about filling the funnel. But the, the way that you get good on the phone is by getting on the phone. And I think that people think the funnel stops here. And there's this whole other funnel that comes out of the <laughs> bottom of it, which is there's as much science and there's as much strategy on a script of a call as there is on a landing page or, or a lead gen initiative. So I just believe that there's a science to sales. And I've worked in a lot of boiler rooms and inside sales rooms where, you know, the, because the marketing was done for us, we came in every day and sharpened our sales acts. We got better at 
presenting and closing and starting the call and uncovering objections and getting around, you know, the, the, I want to wait stuff at the end. And so for me, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are using all the stuff we talked about, Facebook and landing pages and email tools and, and blogs. They're actually using those tools to avoid human interaction. And we're using those tools to increase the number of humans we interact with. And that, I think, is the secret sauce, is that digital is only going to basically be an enabler to more conversations with people. And so if inside your gut you just don't like talking to people, social media won't help, landing pages won't help, you still have to pick up the damn phone. We'll have you back on to talk part two of this conversation of how to how to perhaps sell to internet-based leads. That can be the, the conversation it. in itself. Because clearly that's different to what I did in my device sales of selling to people that actually, well, they don't proactively come to me in person when I'm sat in theater saying, hey, bring this in, Will, and let's play with this. So we'll, we'll definitely have you back on, Chris. We'll definitely do that as part two of this conversation. And um, yeah, just to wrap up this, um, b before you tell us a little bit more about the book, I've got a couple of questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show. First one, other than your own, which we'll come on to in a second, are there any books or resources that you'd recommend to the Salesman Podcast audience? Sure. So uh, mostly sales guys watching, I'm guessing. Uh, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll try to stay away from uh, the marketing books. I, I, actually, I'll make a little bit of an odd recommendation. W when you're in sales, you end up wasting a lot of your time. You know, you end up, uh, what happens is 80% of your income ends up coming from 20% of your actions. And so for me, as I continue to grow my career and then as you start to run a business, you, you, time is all we have and you have to be as efficient with it as possible. So I actually think it's kind of an odd recommendation, but for me as a sales guy who can never turn it off, you know, as somebody that, you know, was working 60 hours a week in the boiler room and, and who sort of neglected his wife and kids to start a company, the four hour work week was actually a really uh, enlightening book for me by Tim Ferriss, where he talks about this idea that, you know, about 80 or 90% of the things you do every day can be outsourced, delegated, or automated. And if you just write down everything you do during the course of a day, you know, you're going to be uh, pretty surprised at how few of those tasks make you money. Uh, I want to do a, a bonus tip, which is predictable revenue. This is from the guy that started the, uh, he, he helped grow the salesforce.com inside sales team to a hundred million in annual sales. And it, and it kind of speaks to the Tim Ferriss book. Real companies don't have their senior salespeople calling leads. They have another role. You know, we kind of call it an ISA. Some people call it an SDR, right? And when you have somebody whose only job is to call and book demos, and then you have somebody that's only job is to call and close those people. They both end up doing their job better because there's nothing more frustrating for a sales guy to get at the end of a call. You crush it. You close them. You get your commission. And then it's like, all right, let me get back on the phone to prospect <laughs> for a couple hours. So there, there's a role there. And uh, that Salesforce book, Predictable Revenue, really speaks to that role. And the four hour work week just speaks to you should want that role if you're in sales. Because passion is what powers profit. And if we wake up every day and do what we love to do and what we're the best at, we'll love our career and our life. And the problem is that most salespeople that are really good at sales, they hate prospecting for appointments. And so Predictable Revenue would be a game changer for people to read. It's a really smart book about that kind of challenge of your highest valued people who close sales often you ask to do your lowest valued work, which is dialing for dollars. For sure. We'll link to both of them in the show notes over at salesman.red. Uh, I think Aaron's coming on the show, actually, author of Predictable Revenue in the not too yeah, recent Aaron future. Ross. Yeah, Aaron um, Ross. Well, he's been booked in for a while now. I think he booked the show out months in advance. Obviously a busy guy. So uh, that'll be an interesting show. I'll link to that show when it comes out in the show notes as well of this episode. Next one, Chris. What is the biggest deal, dollar size if possible, that you've ever closed? Well, that's a... <laughs> That you, th you didn't prep me here, so I didn't go back. I'm just thinking of this off the top of my head, but here's something that's really fresh. Like, it took us three years as a company to get to five million in annual recurring revenue, okay? Which, which is very good. 
uh, and it, it took a lot of work. It took three years. <laughs> so um, we just had our conference last week. And one of the beauties of growing a business now we have, you know, six or 700 clients is that now you can sell more things to them, right? Like the cost to upsell is a lot less than the cost to acquire the client initially. So it took us three years to get to 5 million in annual sales. Uh, and it took us about three hours <laughs> last week to add 1.3 million to our annual revenue numbers. And that was just us getting all of our happy customers together, being really smart about kind of what to sell them next, and then just blowing it off the shelf. So yeah, we did 1.2 million in recurring annual revenue in a one hour presentation last week. So that's pretty damn good. Nice. That is, that is, and you're also touching on something. Oh, congratulations first off, but you're also touching on something uh, which not a lot of the guests mention when I ask this question, and that is the recurring side of things in that you're clearly offering value over the longer term as opposed to shoving your pitch down people's throats and trying to just close that big deal in an instant. So I appreciate that as well. Well, it sure feels good to wake up at the beginning of the year and not be at zero. It, it sure feels good to know that all the work we did for the last four years has led to eight to 10 million in recurring revenue now. And, and that is something that a lot of businesses have still not figured out. You know, even a lot of the website companies we compete with, you know, they're still looking to charge somebody 20 or 30,000 bucks for a custom website when no matter what they build them, it'll be outdated and need upgrades in 16 months. And we're sort of like saying, hey, like for 1200 bucks a month, you know, you're getting a fifty hundred thousand dollar website you know, and isn't the purpose of the site to grow your business? Like the purpose isn't to own the site because here's what happens. You own it and then it all has to change anyway. So yeah, we're big fans of, of that concept of, uh, you know, it, let's say your product today costs 30, maybe it should cost three a month. You know, you still get your same 30 in the first year, but then you don't have to figure it out later. You know, agencies deal with this. They bill by the hour. They, they, they get on a three month retainer and they make a bunch of money but then they don't have any lifetime value except for through referrals. So yeah, it's definitely something people should be thinking about. Think about Microsoft, right? You used to buy a disc with Windows and it was like 300 bucks. And now you have to kind of join the Microsoft cloud and it's like 20, 30 bucks a month. And for them, that actually makes them way more money, <laughs> the, the recurring model. Good man, good man. I've got one final question for you, Chris. And it's gonna ask everyone that comes on the show, uh, other than the one person I forgot to ask uh, right at the beginning. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? That's interesting. That's a great question. I, I, it makes me pause and think because I don't want to just give you a fluffy answer here. Um, the, the one thing that I think uh, that I wish I would have learned faster is that pricing is the price is the price. Like, I, I think that even when you're getting good at sales, we tend to get to where we cover the terms and we kind of get our voice to be a little shaky, you know? And I remember I, I was several years into selling when I, this all clicked for me. So yeah, I wish I would have known it before. <laughs> but a, a guy came in, his name was David Boyce, and he did a big training for us at Quicken Loans. And he said, here's what's funny. When you go through the closing costs of a loan, you get nervous. But when I go buy a big gulp at the at the 7-Eleven down the street, or, or at the gas station, when I go in to buy a soda, when I go to the counter, they don't get nervous. They say $1.79. And I don't counter them. I don't say, well, come on, man, let me get it for $1.39, $1.49. Can you work with me here? So that little quick lesson of just like the price is the price. And, and you need a 7-Eleven mindset. Here's what we charge. Here's how much it costs. And that's how this works. And there's so many people that get beat up on price. And, and the way he framed it was that lambs don't ask lions for food. You know, when you get to the end and you're closing somebody and covering the terms, if they smell any trepidation, if your voice starts to shake, if you say, well, he, so as far, as far as the cost, uh, it's going to be 12, uh, 12, 1200, man, you did all that work. And then you got scared at the end to cover pricing. So uh, I have learned over the years, it took a long time to learn is that the price is the price. And when you talk about the price and when you talk about how much it costs, 
you should talk about it exactly the same as you talk about everything else. And I think if I had been a little bit more confident earlier in my career, you know, when you're a rookie salesperson, they'll try to beat you up on price and you'll say, let me put you on hold and ask my boss. (laughs) Like, let me go see if I can get 10% off. And once you're a seasoned rep, the price is the price. When you get good at sales, you build so much more value than the cost of what you sell that there's already a discount. People just want a fair offer. They don't necessarily need a bargain. And you just you described it really well then. And I've done this in the past as well of uh, the price is X, Y, Z, but I'll see what I can do for you would be like my response because you're trying to, you mentioned the price and you just want to get past it as quick as possible and then carry on with the conversation. So yeah, I think there's uh, there's a lot of value to that, Chris. And with that, mate, tell us a little bit about the book. We've touched on it. You've waved it about on the screen. Uh, so pull it up here for everyone that's watching this on YouTube and it tells where we can find it as well. Yeah, this is my second book. It's called The Conversion Code. It was published through Wiley. I mean, it's got a lot of endorsements like Neil Patel and o- actually Oli Gardner. He's the guy that created Unbounce. Th- these are just huge marketers and, and well-known salespeople. So you can go to theconversioncode.com. The book breaks down into three sections, how to capture leads online, how to turn those leads into appointments, and then how to get on the phone with those leads and dominate the call and get more yeses than noes. And it is a new era. You know, I love Zig Ziglar and I love Brian Tracy and and I love a lot of the people that you've brought on your show. But if you have never sat in a cubicle and called internet leads all day, you really can't coach what that life is like. It's a tough life, man. It's a tough life to be in the cubicle by yourself, dialing a hundred times, hoping people pick up, hoping if they pick up, they don't answer, hang up on you, hoping if they do agree to work with you, they don't back out. And then the next morning, you're right back at it again. And so if you are in the boiler room right now and you're doing inside sales, this is going to instantly be your favorite book because I spent so long doing it that I'm going to speak your language. And ironically, the the kudos for the book, it's a USA Today bestseller, featured in Forbes, featured in Inc., featured in Entrepreneur. And, and, and I think the reason is because it bridges the gap that is a very wide gap between marketing and sales. If marketers had to call leads, they would quit. <laughs> if, if salespeople were responsible for all the leads, the companies would all die. So I hope what I was able to do is just show where that baton really needs to be passed off. Good stuff. And that's over at theconversioncode.com, right? Theconversioncode.com. You can also go to Amazon and just search The Conversion Code. Also, if you're here in the US, uh, it is in all the Barnes and Noble stores. Good stuff. We'll we'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red. I have never sat down and cold called hundreds of people at a day. So I appreciate your insights on this because I know we do have inside salespeople listen to the show as well as the more traditional B2B sales kind of like place where I came from. So they'll have got a lot out of it. We'll have you back on to dive into part two because I think that's going to be equally as valuable for the people who are moving to this or the companies are moving them, whether they've got choice in it or not to this internet lead model. And uh, with that, Chris, I want to thank you for your time and expertise and thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks for all you do. You know, I'm a sales guy at my core and I absolutely love that you're out there teaching this, preaching this, helping people get better at this. Because when you help a salesperson get better, you're you're helping their kids, you're helping their family, you know, because, you know, the more money you make, the more you can provide for the people you care about. So, you know, we teach business and we teach sales, but sometimes what we don't hear about is how that actually impacts people's personal lives, which is for me, the most exciting thing. So thanks for having me on.